Hello. Welcome to the Alex webinar on Web Dewey number building tips and tricks. I'm Felicity Dykus, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee, and I'm the host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Libby Crawford and Caroline Sacucci. Libby is the project manager for the Dewey Decimal System and was one of the designers of Web Dewey. She has worked for more than 15 years with DDC at OCLC and was previously at Solonet. She's also worked in academic and public libraries. Caroline is the program manager and section head of the cataloging and publication and Dewey section at the Library of Congress. Prior to this, she was a SIP program specialist and cataloger in the U.S. General Division. She's active in ELEX and is the Dewey Liaison to the CAM Subject Analysis Committee. She's also on the DDC, the LC representative to the DDC Editorial Policy Committee. So we're really lucky to have people with this kind of experience with us today. A few logistics for today's webinar. All attendees are in listen-only mode. That helps reduce background noise. So if you want to com comment on today's presentation, you can use the Twitter feed, A-L-C-T-S-C-E. And if you have questions or comments for the presenters, please type them into the box on your screen, because we aren't monitoring that Twitter feed. This webinar is being recorded, and all attendees will receive an email with links to the recording and the presentation slides. So now here's Libby. There'll be a slight delay as we change presenters. Hi, I'm Libby Crawford. You should be seeing web, web viewing number building tips and tricks as a slide. One of the things that's been a joy for us to do along with the cataloging and publication program and the Dewey program at, o at LC is have a website that shows you some things that you can do and quite a few things about Dewey. In addition to that, we have a website at OCLC for the same thing. This is us. Um, we, I think we both like bright colors. Just wanted to show you who we, what we look like. The agenda is this. We've got a basic number building workflow. And this is a cheat sheet you may find later that is helpful to print out. We're going to talk about the number building assistant and how it works. We're going to define user terms. And Car Caroline's going to work on defining user terms and creating and using comments for local practice. We found out many, many years ago in the beginning of Dewey that, Web Dewey, that we needed to have uh, comments for local practice because many of us, and I remember doing this very vividly, wrote sticky notes and put them in the books. Sorry about that. So here's the basic number building workflow. I know, please don't get scared with seeing a flowchart for this kind of thing. We found that it works a little bit better, and we have a few in Dewey. So what you do is you start with the number span and look at the add instructions, or you find the base number. You click Start, Add, and the system will display the notation specified by the add instruction or display table one. It defaults to table one because that's the table that anything can be added from. Well, if the number is building complete, you verify the number, you click save, the user term box appears, you select user terms, ones that you like. If they need to be changed, you change them. You add it, you click update. Is there an additional term needed for whatever reason? Yes, no. You need to add it, click the additional term and click Add. Select the term and set it to the caption. Save as an institution, null, or person visibility. And here's what's important. With WebDUI, your individual author, if you save it as, an as a personal visibility, it's only you that sees that. If you save it as institutional visibility, um, everybody in the institution that shares that symbol can see number you fill. I verify the presence in the hierarchy so I can be sure that what I really put there is there. 
If you want to contribute to the DOE editors, you can. If you don't contribute it, you only see the visibility as your institution or your person. One of the things that's really cool about contributing to the DOE editors is these numbers can be vetted by the editors. And if we find that there's something that's used a lot by quite a number of other libraries, we may add that to the, as a built number to the classification. I know that's a lot. It'll all make sense a little bit later. I've had some questions about the symbols within WebDewey because they're a little bit different than what we've seen before. We have a start, we initiate the number building process, and it's guided by the DOE instructions. There's a lot of logic that's built behind this so that the, build, the numbers can be built easily. You add, and you can add components to the number that's under construction. Hey, there's always a back out button. The delete button gives you a chance to delete the last step in your number building process. Edit local means that if you're building a number that's not quite with the rules, you can edit locally. Caroline's going to talk a little bit more about that later. You can cancel the number building operation. And when I've been playing with it particularly, I cancel a heck of a lot. You can save your number and you initiate indexing. You can update it. You can edit and save a term selected with the radio buttons. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. You can add. Um, you can browse. Um, and you launch the browser with that. You can delete the term. You can save the number in the caption with personal or uh, institutional visibility, as we've already talked about. You can contribute by sending the number and the user terms to the GWE editors. And you can delete. And Deleting deletes the whole thing. And it, you get a pop-up box asking if you really want to delete. So here's the number building assistant. I have Russian blue cats, and they're goofy. Um, so we want to create a cartoon guide to short hair cats. So we're going to start with the base number. We're going to add a standard subdivision. We're going to add user terms. And we're going to save it for whoever we want to save it for. So you start with the base number. Well, the base number is short hair cats. You click the start button here after you found the number. You can do find a number that you're looking for, that base number, by search, browse, any any other regular ways you would search by Julie. Well, in the notes here in, include chartreuse and Russian blue cats. Mine happen to be Russian blues. So that's kind of why we picked this. Got standard subdivisions that pops up at when we click Start. So we have the list of standard subdivisions. Well, that's what this looks like. And we're going to go to Add is with the next thing we would click. I know this is tiny and hard to read, but this is the first part of the Start, the start button. This is the first part. You have to scroll down in the schedules. So we look at the bottom half of the schedule and you get more information. We found that within the, the listing you find humorous treatment. We click add and get short hair cats humorous treatment. And this is what it looks like. And the see the little person there that's, the, that's saying it defaults to individual instead of institution, which is a pretty good thing. Visibility. So we pick short hair cats. We it's defaulted to short hair cats, humorous treatment. You see we have radio buttons here to give us other opportunities for things that we might want to look at. And again you see personal visibility versus institutional visibility. So we decided Short hair cats, humor, car cartoons and humor were the important things. So we're going to select those. We're going set to that, set that to update. That's how we get to the point of saving it as that. We have update, then we set it as a caption. You have to click set it as caption. This gives you lots of checks and balances in case you do something that you may or may not like. 
So we've got short haircuts, cartoon, humor, um, which is sort of explains my cats. Now, the next example we're going to do is create a new number for labor economics in Peru. We're going to start with the base number for labor economics. We're going to add a standard subdivision. We're going to add user terms, and then we're going to save it for institutional personal use. What we did is we started with labor economics, and I've already shown you the results of the start action with the standard subdivisions displayed. We came up with the, the number for labor economics just by searching for labor economics as a, as a subject. Uh, we click Start. We add. And if you get something other than Table 1, you probably add it in a different place that, that's not really the right way to be adding things. Just so you know, I've done it a number of times. We select the standard subdivision, in this case, History, ge Geographic Treatment, and Biography. And we are instructed to add to the base number in Team 109 the notation from Table 2 for the subject is North America or Brazil or whatever. In this case, we click Add at this point. And then we, find, we go through the schedules. We scroll through and find uh, South America. Another thing you can do is type in the word Peru but sometimes it's faster to, to scroll through the tables or go down the hierarchy. I find it is faster to do that. So we find Peru. We're given options for Northern Department, Central Department, Southern Department, Eastern Department. I really just want Peru. So we're going to click uh, the, the T285 Peru. We're going to add it. And then you come up with this number. This is labor economics in Peru. You can also back out and not use Peru if you choose to by clicking the X. So we come to user terms. The default user terms in this case for labor economics in Peru, which is what you would expect. You could just set that as a caption, or you can update it to another caption. We're going to set that as a caption. But this is the results from that save action that I said. I checked to see whether it made it into the hierarchy. This definitely made it to the hierarchy because you see it when you uh, see your subscription and see your version of classification. So this is how the built, you can modify this number, this built number, if you choose to do it. Uh, you can modify the captions. And it can be contributed to the GUI editors. If you look down here, you'll see the Contribute button. And the cool thing is, when you do the send it to the editors, they can look to see how it was built. Um, generally, WebDewey won't let you build things unless it's according to the editorial rules. So this is the note of the placement in the hierarchy, so you can see exactly how it fits. So you see library comments. In this case, for example, if you had had um, what, uh, labor economics in China, it would appear as it normally appears in the hierarchy. Uh, it would appear before um, the Peru because of where Asia is in the hierarchy. I think this is kind of a fun example. Um, I know that from a number of situations we've seen people try to create uh, numbers for directories and things like that. And I know we had a hard time when I was at my last university with figuring out directories for various sports or various places and trying to be sure we knew what we were doing. We wanted to create a new number for directories of college sports in Canada. Um, we start with the base number. We add the sender subdivision. Uh, we add or edit user terms, and we save it for uh, institutional personal use. And since this is, uh, by and large, a uh, commonly done thing, you might want to contribute it to the jury editors. So we start with da -da -da -da, college sports, 796.043. And then we have the results of the start action. Well, this case is a little easier to see. 
because you see that um, directories of persons or organizations is a little bit higher in the uh, in table one than with what we've had in the past. So this is what you see with the start, and this is this, the bot kind of the bottom half of the screen. You have the notes and tell you exactly how to do that. So we've got college sports start. Now we clicked on the number T one O two five direct three to sports and uh, and organizations and hit add. So that's what we come up with. If you see in the bar, it creates the number there for you. So the standard subdivision is 21.025. Well, we want to get to Canada, so we go down to T2 and find Canada, and we add that. This is what we come up with. This is the pre-populated user term, college sports directory is the persons and organization Canada. You know, frankly, that's a long subject heading. I think I really would like to do something else. So what I really want to do is college sports directories Canada. I select those with the radio buttons. I click update. And this is what I get. Then I collect, I Click set as caption. If I decided I didn't really want um, Canada, that I wanted only Ontario, I could go back to table two and find the provinces of Canada and find Ontario and do this, commit the same steps and come up with the same thing. Again, this is how what it looks like. You can contribute it or you can delete it whatever you'd like. And since you've already seen the steps on how to do this, we'll just give you the kind of 15,000 foot view of how to do this. We're going to build travel a number on travel in Brazil in 2012. We start with geography of travel. So we start with 90, the number 91. From T2, we get Brazil is 81. And then we have the travel, historical periods for travel, which brings us to 981.0066. I can't read today because 2011 is from table 4.66. So this is what the steps look like. Add to the base number the notation from table two. So table two brings us eight one is the number for Brazil. Add the historical periods following the zero that appear in the subdivisions of nine three zero through nine nine zero. So if you wanted to do travel in England during the House of Tudor, it would be nine one four point two zero four five. But in this case, we're looking for the 20th century and it's point zero six six. I mean, excuse me, four six six. We're going to build a number for history of Jews in Romania. Again, we start with history. The we add table two number four nine eight. We add specific ethnic and national groups, Hebrew specific ethnic and national groups, we find Hebrews, Israelis, and Jews. So again, we add, we start with a history and geography number, we add to the base number, we add Romania, which gets us to uh, nine, uh, nine, four, nine, eight. We add the notation 04 from table five to give us a history and civilization number. And then we have Hebrews, Israelis, and Jews for 94. We're going to, I know, we, I long ago and far away, uh, I worked for the deaf community, and one of the things that we had to do was understand the grammar of uh, American Sign Language. 
and we navigated to this uh, number span for 419.4, and we had sign languages, North America grammar. So what we did is we added to the base number of 419 the notation from Table 2, yet again, North America, and then grammar is farther down in the, in the hierarchy, so the grammar is uh, from the standard form of the language. That's how we got to this. Chimera language readers for English-speaking people. This is an interesting um, number. So what we did was we started with uh, the 495.9. We got to T6, the Chimera, and then readers, and spe readers for speakers of specific languages. So we were looking at readers for speakers of English, not Chimera. So we have the miscellaneous languages of Southeast Asia, which is 495.9. We have Table 6, Khmer Cambodian, the following notations never used alone, uh, but may be used as required by add notes under specific subdivisions. We're told to add to, the, add to base number 24864 the notation from Table 6, 2 through 9, readers in a language other than Spanish or whatever. So the readers in this case are English. That's how we got to this. And now I'm going to turn it all over to Caroline who's going to talk about defining user terms and comments. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Libby. Let me change my screen here. But I think before we do that, we want to ask you a poll question. Have you ever used the Web Dewey Number Building Assistant? And we're going to give you a few seconds to open. Uh, the poll's open now, so go ahead and um, answer the question. It's a yes/no question, and we'll in a couple in a, in a you know, few seconds we'll check back and see how we're doing. And we have 100%. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, 68% voted. How is that possible that we have 40% and a 60% and that only be 68%? Hmm. Well, anyway, about half of you say who've answered say that you have used it and 40%, and 60% of you have not used it before. Oh, you know what? Maybe this is because of groups. Maybe that's why um, the numbers are a little bit skewed. But it looks like some of you have used it, so this is really good. Um, Okay, great. So having done that, I'm going to go ahead and move on and start talking about defining user terms. There we go. Okay. So Libby talked a little bit about how you can um, select a user term that's in uh, the, what's available to you from the list of terms, and these terms are coming from the relative index for the number that was selected for that piece of the number built. So for instance, um, you see here 616.994 in the relative index, these are all of the terms that you can possibly see. Um, in, the, in the relative index for 661.71, specific to bones, those are the relative index terms that you can see and so on. So um, what it's going to do is to default to the term that is uh, mapped to that number that's actually showing up in the hierarchy. So 616.994 is for cancers, that's what shows up in the hierarchy, but that might not be the most relevant term that you want to use for your own purposes. Uh, you might think that malignant tumors medicine or medical oncology is a better fit for what you need. Um, same thing for um, 611.71 for bones. You might specifically are talking about the pelvic bone or the skeleton and so on. So the point about the user term, uh, being able to set new user terms or add new user terms is that whatever you need for your purposes, um, this is not going to be seen by the editors. Um, if you contribute a number, the number that um, the edit, the, 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 sorry, the um, heading that appears with the editorially mapped number is going to be, um, that heading is going to be selected by the editors. It may or may not be what you've selected. 
but if you ever are searching in WebDUI, you will see the number and the terms that you've personally selected. So your number might be valid, but the editors might say that your um, terms are not the ones that they would use editorially, but you'll still see whatever you selected. So regardless, feel free to contribute numbers. Um, so how do you do that with a little more detail? Um, so we want to edit the user term for 616.9947159. And I'm not even going to go into whether or not you would ever actually use such a long number. We do that all the time here in the Dewey Office of the Library of Congress. We create long numbers. More often than not, you'll see them with a seg segmentation slash mark, which I'm not sure if you noticed um, on the examples, the segment or the slash showed up in the hierarchy. I forgot which example it was. I think the first or second example showed that um, wherever the breakoff was that you would use for the, for the abridged number. But forgetting that point, <laughs> we're going to use 616.9947159 for bone cancer surgery. So you review the default user term, which is based on captions. We're going to edit the user terms to match the predominant pattern and the relative index for similar works, bone cancer surgery. Click update, edit the user term again to match the alternate pattern and the relative index for similar works, such as bone neoplasm surgery. Click add, set as caption. So those are the basic steps for that. So make sure that after you key in the terms you want, select add. Selecting update works only if you select from the radio buttons. So if you want something different from what you see on the radio buttons, you have to select Add. Uh, and then you will manually key the terms in. Then you need to set it as the caption. This will preserve your caption in your account, personal or institutional. And if you want everyone in your institution to see the number, obviously that's the best thing. You know, we have um, six or seven classifiers working on a daily basis at the Library of Congress, and anyone can see any of the numbers that um, his or her colleagues has established. And the nice thing about that is if you're working in an area that you don't often work in, that number's already built for you, which is great. You don't have to think about it again. Um, and of course, we create a lot of unique numbers here at the Library of Congress, so you can imagine that that would have definite value here, and I'm sure it could have value for you too. And of course, in the next segment of this discussion, I'll talk about using the comments that will also help you in your institutional practice. Um, what am I going to say? Um, so, moving on to the next slide. We want to modify um, the terms for 942.1004916. You want Irish and London history interdisciplinary treatment. So, that's the number, the, the user term that shows up is history and geography dash dash greater London dash dash Irish, which Irish is not even capitalized. I don't understand that, but it isn't. I think it has to do with the syntax of the user terms and how it shows in that box, even though the term that shows up in the relative index, of course, is capitalized. Um, obviously, that's something you might want to fix, and it's not even a very um, user-friendly setup, history and geography greater London Irish. That has to do with um, the way the Table 2 index worked out. So you have your 900 history and geography, which is where it's taking that first uh, set of terms before the dash dash. Um, T2421, uh, Greater London is the first one. And then the ethnic and national groups, it's picking Irish up from that. The 930 to 990 colon 00, zero it has to do with um, the ad table, the internal ad table. Um, that has been selected in order to be able to add table five or whichever other table. So sometimes when you're looking at um, the list of pieces of the, of the Dewey number that you're building, you won't necessarily see the number that is added there if it has to do with an internal add table. That's there because Web Dewey needs to have that as part of the logic. So if you see something that doesn't quite fit because you don't understand why it needs to be there, you don't see it as part of the user terms, you really don't even see it as part of the number that's being built, it's there because the logic has to be built in. It has to know that it's taking it from a particular um, internal table such as the 930 to 990 ethnic and national groups. So what do we do if we don't like those user terms? Oops. What did I do with my... Um, 
You review the default user terms based on the captions, edit the user terms to match the predominant pattern and the relative index for similar works, such as Irish, London, England. And then the tip for editing is to use the radio button for the relative index entry, London, England, to get correct mark coding for geographic terms. Then place the cursor at the far left of the user terms box and type Irish, and click update. And this is what we see, Irish dash dash London, England, which is not any of the things that are appearing in the list of radio buttons. So that's a brand new one. Oh, and I should mention that we need to add that and then set it as a caption. And as again, that caption is what will show up in your hierarchy. If that is what will show up, whether you contribute it or not, that number with that user term that you selected will be what shows up, whether you contribute or not, because the, the editors will review that and decide if, it's, if, if they like it. If they don't like it, they'll put whatever user term is appropriate for the editorial rules, and then your term will show up, their term will show up for anybody else using it. I think it's a great tool. So now I want to talk about creating and using comments for local practice. And I found this to be really valuable, especially in institutions that don't necessarily follow to the letter Dewey practice. That is to say, you want to do something in a way that, that collects your material separately from the way necessarily you would find it um, classified in Dewey. And the example that really comes to mind is, for instance, in a public library setting or even in a, in a community college setting where you want to have your vocational guidance materials together. And according to Dewey, they would go by the subject. So a vocational guidance book or career guidance book on being an airline pilot would go in one area in the 600s, and one dealing with um, being a historian, for instance, might go, or a librarian, they go in different parts of Dewey, but you want them all together on your shelves in one area, and you want to make sure that everybody in your institution does that when they get the book. And it might even mean reclassifying something that came through with a Dewey number that was a valid Dewey number, um, either through the SIP program or somewhere else on a copycat record. And you say, but we don't use that because we want our numbers to be together. How can I do this so that it's always um, uniform for my institution? And one of the ways to do that is to set up a comment. So we'll talk about searching for comments and also creating comments here. And this is the basic comment box. And there's, we'll talk about all the different features about it. So as I said, why do this? As I said, it provides quick access to guidelines that reflect local practice for the user or the institutional level comment. Comments preserve decisions about classification, saving time by avoiding duplication of intellectual effort. And then why search for comments? You want to review the comments associated with the DDC number you want to use to classify an item. You want to check for information on standards and practices applicable to the material you are cataloging. And you want to find a note to use as a template for creating similar comments. So, as I said, I'm going to talk about the example of vocational guidance. So you get a lot of vocational guidebooks, and you want to become how to become a chef, a lawyer, a teacher, etc. And where do you put these materials? If you search the relative index for vocational guidance, you will see the note at 331.702, vocational guidance, instructing the classifier to see the vocation or specialty, adding notation T1, 023, for instance, careers in accounting at 657.023. So clearly, Dewey is telling you, put it with the subject or with the topic. Don't put it with vocational guidance, put it with the topic. Using this method, which is standard Dewey practice, your books on vocational guidance will be scattered across your collection. What if you want your users to find all your vocational guidebooks in one place? You can set up a comment just for this purpose. User comments can be used to document an institutional decision, such as the, uh, such as the decision to put all vocational guidebooks in 331.702. Don't worry. 
the Dewey police won't arrest you if you decide to institute a local practice, which is at odds with standard Dewey practice. The goal is serving your users. And by the way, this is a real world solution. When I gave a training on the number building assistant and user terms last, um, a few years ago to a large group of public librarians in the suburbs of Chicago, this very request came up from a librarian. And I learned while trying it out during a live presentation that it really can work. So this is actually a real world example that I did in a live presentation using Web Dewey. And I figured if her institution has already instituted this policy um, about collecting vocational guidebooks together, uh, and since the user comments can support this work, this workflow probably could be applied elsewhere, which is why I want to show it to all of you today. So to create a comment, we're going to go to the number where the comment should appear. So if we want to go back to 331.702, because this is where we will document that all vocational guidance materials will be classed. So click on comments on the top orange bar comments. There's, there it is right there. You can see the comment and the record. You can, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, and you can edit it here as well. You can also try to get it by searching comments. But now you want to also build institutional numbers based on this local practice. So click Start. And there's the, the comment right there. Once you start the number building process, you'll need to work around the system to create this number. Let's say you want to build the number for vocational guidebooks for accountants. Note that I'm reversing the example at the 331702 note which says to class this kind of material in 657.023. Once you start the number building process, you'll need to work, oh. you search accounting and get 657. When you click on 657, you open the hierarchy. Now you can select Add. But when you do this, you will get an error message in red. You need to do the workaround. Select Add Local. And that's one of the um, symbols that Libby showed you at the very beginning. Uh, and now this is how you can use the Add Local, um, add local feature and you'll get another message. Number building engine will not be able to validate number and the number cannot be contributed. Do you want to proceed? And you'll say okay. So this is an example of yes, you can use it for institutional and personal, but you won't be able to contribute it because it's not a valid number because you had to edit local. But that's okay because this is for your institutional practice anyway. So select add no zeros before this number and click okay. and there's your built number. Now you can save it to your personal or institutional account. <clears throat> we'll select institutional because we want everyone to take advantage of your work and classify materials consistently. Now we want to select the appropriate user term by selecting the radio buttons and choosing update. We don't need to add or set as caption because the terms we want are listed there. Nicely for change, right? Sometimes they're not. So now our user built number is in the hierarchy. We use the add local feature, which is why there's a question mark to the left. The editors will never know that you did this because you can't possibly contribute the number. The two Lego people indicate that this is an institutional number. And you can now see the comment at 331.702. Maybe we want to edit the comment to tell classifiers to build all numbers for vocational guidance using the steps we just went through. So we'll select edit next to our, um, our, user, com um, our user comment. There it is right there, we'll edit. Now you have your, defined your policy and documented the steps for the next person or yourself. And there you see in the comments is what I put. Please class all materials on vocational guidance at this number. Expand for the discipline. 
to build numbers, start, search discipline, e.g., accounting at 657, add local, add no zeros, adjust user term to say vocational guidance topic, and update, save to institution. And by the way, I'm not sure if you've noticed it, but I have rearranged the boxes on my web Dewey screen so that the create built number is at the top. And I still have it that way at work because I'm using it. I, I use the number building assistant all the time and I found that it's easier for me to see it at the top of my screen. So I'm not sure if you were aware that you really can move modules of the web Dewey screen all around. And so I've used um, to put my, um, my um, number building start option from the bottom right to the top right. I have my hierarchy on the left, I can see it very clearly, and I have um, my relative index terms and my notes are still displayed pretty easily. In this um, example, you see the comments, which is what I want people to see um, in the middle of the screen underneath because this is a comment we're looking at. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask the question for the poll, do you currently use comments for local practice? And the poll is now open. And we'll give you a moment. And where is the poll. Hmm. I'm looking for the results of the poll. Let's see. Huh. Um, while we figure this one out, I will go on to the next screen. Well, this is too bad. I wish I could see. Ah, there it is. Ha ah. So, um, 28, oh, 75%, thank you, Libby was able to, 75% um, of you said, no, you have not used the local comments, but that means that 25% probably have. So this is really good, and I would encourage you, if you have that need at your local institution, um, definitely take advantage of it, because it's a very useful tool. And maybe this example will give you ideas for other areas that you might, or this particular example, maybe you never thought of it. Um, but if you um, have a situation in your institution that uh, will call for such an individualized uh, treatment for a, a special class of material, this is a really good way to implement that for everyone. And so I just want to point out some resources um, that are available to you for free. The online Dewey training courses are there. Um, there's a lot of really cool information. I'm not sure how many of you have seen them. And um, the Dewey blog is great. Um, I know they always are posting really interesting articles about how to use Dewey. Um, one of our editors, Julie Beal, she had created a number of really um, exquisite and clear uh, articles about how to use the number building assistant for cataloging material in music. So if that's an area that you work in, um, web, the, the new number building assistant can be a little bit tricky for internal ad tables, and the music classification is one of those areas. Um, and to help people out, she created a number, I think two parts. There was one, one Dewey blog entry for music uh, classification, and then a second one dealing with different kinds of, um, I think, music ensemble versus um, cataloging music scores or something like that. So anyway, they have examples on how to uh, make the most of the number building assistant. Um, correlation searching and classification web, if you are um, a subscriber to classification web, the Dewey classification versus LC hierarchy classification and LC subject heading classification has a lot of useful stuff as a starting point, at least to get you started in the number that you want to use. I always validate that to make sure that the number that it's showing me matches that LC classification because at the Library of Congress, of course, we um, do both LC classification and, and Dewey is, is, a, is an extra thing that we do. So all of our things have LC classification and it's a starting place for me as a, cat, as a cataloger classifier 
um, to be able to say, oh, okay, this was a number that was often used for this type of material. Let me go on Web Dewey, verify that number, and then start, and I can start using the number building assistant to help me out if I need to. And then, of course, I think Libby mentioned it before, the Library of Congress has its own Dewey program website that has information about specific things that we do at the Library of Congress related to Dewey. And on it are a number of other links that will link you out in addition to the, the Dewey blog, the, the training courses, also the SIP program, uh, and other things uh, relevant to the Library of Congress. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our host um, to take over um, any questions we have. Well, thank you, Libby and Caroline. That was a lot of a, I'm not a Dewey user, but I was impressed with building numbers. So we have time for questions, so please type those into the question box. And I'll start with one I have. So you both talked about sometimes saving something to individual, sometimes to institution, sometimes for Dewey editors. I guess those were different features, though. So, no. so, so do you have suggestions for why you, you save it individual or institutions? Okay, well, let me give you an example of what I did long ago and far away. I was classifying um, uh, quite a bit of material, move, actually moving computer science around, and I had the hardest time to remember what how we were classifying specific programs. Could not remember to save my life. So I saved this, this individual comment for my, this was back before you contributed to, to the editors and saved it, but didn't want to do it. But I saved this individual comment as a comment as opposed to what you're seeing now in number building for myself because I, in actually the note said, dummy, you keep it here. Um, the institution comments or, or institution contributions and number building are really to share across and keep other people from having to do it. And if the, we have people, editors, uh, classifiers in a number of places that want to help the editors and provide them with additional numbers um, that, of things that we may, uh, may not have thought about as the editors or we may not have, may not have hit us in the same way they've hit um, public libraries or other libraries from around the world. And that's why you would contribute things to the editors. Okay, thank you. Here's another question. What is the significance of the star-like orange symbol that appears to the left of some numbers? The star-like? <laughs> no, it's a puzzle piece. Oh, a puzzle piece, this it's thing right here. It's a puzzle piece, yeah. <clears throat> you want to tell them, Caroline? That puzzle piece, yeah, it is what is um, considered, a, it's a built number, which is to say it's editorially built, and if one of the numbers you contributed is editorially um, reviewed, that would also become a built number, which means that you can trust that it's a valid, completely valid number. I will say, though, that using the um, number building assistant does not work from a built number. So if you have, um, let me give you another example that's not, um, so for instance, accountants, 657.092, you always know as accountants, but that's, 092 is a number that indicates um, biography. So this is a, maybe used for biography of accountants. Well, you're not going to start with that built number to then find out what you do to add it for um, geographic. You don't want to, this is not a number you would use to start to say, where are accountants in um, Africa. You know, this is, so a built number is just, it's a number you can use, but you always need to start with a base number that's not a built number to use the number building assistant correctly. Okay. Uh, Libby, I'm wondering, at the beginning you said that the workflow would make more sense after you went through the examples. Would you go back to that workflow and, and go through it again now that we've seen those examples? Yeah. I'll go to it here. Let me do it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I know, but I'm on the screen. <laughs> I have the, um, let's see, I can go back, well, so we don't have to change presenters here. There right. We go. There you go. Okay, yes, so this goes back to, you find the number to start with. You look at, you be sure that there's an add instruction, or you look for a base number, and a base number would be something like 
the 9 or 9-1 when we were talking about history of whatever, or Brazil. Then you click Add or Start. Then the system displays the notation specified by the Add instruction or displays by Table 1. Okay. If you've got everything you need, you verify the number, you save it, then you go back to Caroline and the user terms and you select user terms. Um, and the, and the, the user terms that appear in, after you've built a number are definitely user terms that are the captions specifically from uh, WebDuly. Does it need to be changed because your group doesn't, your, your users might not get that? Um, or, is, or you've got another bias? For whatever reason, I think the medical example that, that Caroline had with lung cancer is really good. So did the user terms need to be changed? I also agree with her about the Irish in uh, London. Um, so if you've got to change the, the user terms based on what your community understands, if anybody was going to be the Dewey police, it would be me, and I'm not going to be coming after you if you do something different. I promise. Um, nor am I going to come after you if, if you bring all your vocational guidance books together. Frankly, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you edit the term. You click Update. If you need to add an additional term, you do it. You save it. You set the term. You set, set the term as a caption. You save it as an institution of personal visibility. I always go back and verify that it's in a hierarchy. Um, it's kind of suspenders in a belt for me. But it also, you can do that by just looking on the left side of the screen. Yeah. That shows the hierarchy. I mean, it's going to show you. I also, can I say something, Libby, too, about that? Yeah. Is anytime you get to a number that you have created, you will always see the entire screen of right. what you built will always be there for you. So mm -hmm. you can always see, how did I do that? So if you're looking to um, create something else based on something that you created, you can go back and review the steps you did for that number. Um, so I think that's a really nice feature about this program as well. So sorry, I just wanted to interject. No, that. thank you, because I can't remember everything. I appreciate the help. <laughs> um, and, and another thing about the Dewey Editors, you, I, I hope you all understand, is we're all trying to make it easier for users in the field. It may seem a little like some of the things are a little arcane, but there's a reason behind it. Um, and there's quite a bit of intellectual um, work that goes behind the creating classification. Um, I can't imagine this kind of work being done without, frankly, the brilliant editors and the work of um, the classifiers at the Library of Congress throwing the stuff over the wall rather frequently. Um, it's been helpful in, in us understanding the things that are actually being published regularly. You can't organize knowledge in a vacuum. Um, does that help? Yes, yes. Here's a question about the editing, the editors. If you contribute a number to the Dewey editors, do you receive confirmation of receipt? And will they send corrections if someone got it wrong? We're working on that feature right now. Um, we have not gotten a ton of uh, editorially contributed numbers. We've gotten a few, and from very specific um, institutions. And we work with those institutions, especially if there's an area that it looks like there's an area of the classification that may need some work. We'll certainly work with those classifiers to help figure that out. But right now, we don't have an automatic um, or automatic take the pick uh, way of, of notifying people that we got your numbers and we're going to do something with them. OK. Sorry about that. Who are the editors? OK, we, we've, got, we've got two full-time editors, Rebecca Green and Alex Curios. Are, so are they LC staff? They're OCLC staff. OCLC staff, OK. But their office is there at the Library of Congress. Well, office, um, yeah. They sit with the Dewey classifiers at the Library of Congress. Yeah. Oh. Very much a symbiotic relationship. Very much. 
Yeah, and they're always, I mean, the classifier's coming up to them um, saying, oh, you know what, I'm seeing um, material on, this is a good example, and Libby can speak to this one too, on uh, things that are about lactose intolerant recipes or gluten, you know, gluten-free this or health related to that, and there isn't a place for them in the classification. And these are things that are coming through the SIP program, the Cataloging and Publication Program, as really new hot topics. You see it all about in the media. Um, but it's not accommodated for in um, Dewey yet. Okay, what do we do about this? And it generates um, the, editorial, the editorial process for them to think about an exhibit and create something that the editorial policy committee, which I, I serve on, looks at and says, yes, this is a good idea. Yes, this um, makes sense. Yes, we need to accommodate this. How do we do this? This is how they're going to expand the numbers, expand the hierarchy or whatever. And so that's an example of... Um, the classifiers working one-on-one -on -one directly, walking literally two cubicles down <laughs> to say, yeah. hey, Alex and, and Rebecca, we need this to uh, accommodate um, the you know, new research coming out. Okay. Let's see. Uh, is, this is a broader Web Dewey question. Is Web Dewey published both in abridged and full versions, and how, how do they differ? Web Dewey is not published in both full and abridged. Abridged numbers, as Caroline mentioned, uh, are available within WebDewey as indicated by the segmentation marks. Caroline, can you? Yes, is there some, I will. Do you remember? Yep. Um, the segmentation marks indicate abridged numbers. We uh, don't really have a need for two separate interfaces. Uh, abridged numbers are designed for libraries and collections of less than 20,000 titles uh, in a general collection. And um, if you've got a rather specific collection, you, know, you probably need full with the full edition anyhow to get, to get into depth of that particular subject area. I, one of the things that I had was a, um, a school that was a culinary arts institute, and they had a general collection that had less than 20,000 titles. But let me tell you about their culinary arts institute. I just I thought I died and went to heaven with all the cookbooks that were there and every kind of uh, ethnic food you could think of and every kind of food you could absolutely think of. So they really had to have full Dewey to be able to organize that culinary arts piece. It really, it, it, de it depends on your situation. One of the things that we continue to publish is uh, Religion 200 as a separate kind of publication, for, particularly for uh, religious libraries or libraries that have a, a religion bent for church libraries and things like that. Great. How often is Web Dewey updated? Web Dewey is updated continually. Okay. That's great. I just want to show this screen, um, talk about it a little bit to explain what I was saying before. If you ever go to the hierarchy, in Web Dewey yeah. to a number that you have built, and there you can see because your little icon and little person there. And I can go in and do anything to this number, but I can also change it from personal to institutional. I can change the, the user terms, um, and or I could delete it if I wanted to. Um, and uh, But every single time I get to this place in the hierarchy, this screen will show so I can see exactly what it is that I did what numbers and how the tables were put together and so on. So I just wanted to point that out. Great, thank you. Okay, well thank you very much. That was, that was a lot of information. I'm going to have to review that again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, So we trust you found today's session useful. If you want to review it, you'll be receiving an email with a link to the recording and the slides. The email will also include a, a, include a link to a short evaluation form. Please take time to fill that out as the Continuing Education Committee looks at that feedback for future webinars. You all now also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That'll be in the email too, so you'll have a, a form you can print out and personalize. Thanks to our presenters, Libby and Caroline. Also, thank I want you. to thank Ai Ping, Chen Gaffey, and Catherine Balak. They're on our Continuing Education Committee. 
and Megan Doherty from the Alexa office. Their help behind the scenes help us to present these webinars. And we have a lot more webinars coming up. I've noted them here just because I'm excited about the different ones coming. So preserving digital collections, but also preservation week we have two, from cassette to cloud, reformatting audio tape and preserving your digital life. In May, two of a different sort, is technical services dead? and current trends and skills and technical services. So I think all of, that'll help all of us look forward to where we're going in technical services. And then in June, we have a virtual pre-conference. So that's two days, and there'll be multiple presentations on metadata automation. So for anyone working with metadata, you may get some ideas of how to speed up your workflow. Alex also offers web courses. So these are four to six weeks on various topics. So you have an instructor who will go in more depth on these topics. And e-forums are two-day email chats. So we have one of those coming up this month. I'm not mobile. Can I still advance? So on this slide, too, you're going to see a link that will take you to the Alex website, give you more information. and an option to, for you to propose different topics. So thank you for joining us today, and that includes, concludes our session. Thank you. Thank you.